Sylvester said that he was being absolutely faithful uh, to what Baxter had written. We know that in a number of ways, in fact, he wasn't. This was partly because it was all but impossible. What Sylvester was given was a mass of manuscripts in a very disordered state, but also a variety of instructions and directions. Put this bit here and let's have that bit there and so on. And he says in his own uh, introduction that uh, sometimes he couldn't find things and sometimes he found them and then couldn't find them again. So that was part of his difficulty, but he was also of conscious that um, things had moved on in terms of expectations, taste, decorum, since Baxter started writing in the 1660s. Baxter wrote this in various stages from about 1664 to 1685, and it was published in 96. Baxter himself uh, was born in 1615. So embodied in his text are the manners and the expectations and the conventions of a much earlier period than the period in which Sylvester was working. So the second way in which it was very difficult for him simply to follow Baxter had to do with his sense that his readership would expect a kind of decorum and politeness that Baxter didn't always provide. Uh, so in these two respects, both the difficulty of working with the manuscript, tailoring it to the audience of the late 17th century, he wasn't entirely accurate. And then he transcribed the whole thing for the press and there were simple errors in, in transcription. What we've been able to do is both look more systematically at the kind of editorial alterations that Sylvester makes, and some of them are perfectly reasonable. Some of them do seem to be uh, constrained by what was considered appropriate, what was decorous at the time. Um, and others are really just editorial tinkering that is supposedly to flatten and smooth things out and make it more stylistically appropriate. Uh, there's one point at which Baxter describes uh, disorderly conduct as seldom attaining the good ends um, which they are used for. And as we all know, as a decent editor, that you should never really end a sentence with a preposition. So Sylvester tinkers the sentence to suggest that disorderly conduct seldom attains the good ends for which they are used. About 50% of the alterations between the manuscript and the printed edition um, are purely stylistic. So things like modal auxiliaries, a shift from a could to a would, that seem almost inconsequential to us, but clearly meant something in terms of the, the precision that uh, Sylvester is hoping to bring to the text. Now we've been able to now, going through all of the manuscripts that are ex extant, identify most of the passages that um, Calamy felt were inappropriate to include. Um, so the dream, for instance, is a um, slightly unfortunate paragraph in which Baxter dreams about stamping chickens to death. It's in fact bang in the middle of his debates with the Anabaptist John Toombs. Um, so clearly what Baxter is doing is, is talking all day about Anabaptistry, whether or not you are um, welcomed into the church as a child when you are baptised, or whether or not you have to make a more informed adult decision to become a church member. And then he dreams that he's being disturbed in his study by chickens or by chicks, and that he gets so frustrated with trying to usher them out of the door so he could leave him in peace so he could study, that he ends up trampling them to death. Um, and then he realises that in fact what is happening is what happens in Matthew chapter 3, whereby Jesus says he will be the hen and he will take people under his wing. So what you should be doing with chicks is offering this protective counsel, this protective kind of cocoon of spirituality almost. And you should be doing that, not with chickens, with chicks, with babies, with children. So that's clearly the kind of material that he's been reading and preparing for his debates with an Anabaptist.
and it feeds its way into his dream life and dream cycle. And it becomes one of the key texts that he regularly cites throughout his debates with the Anabaptists. But Baxter said he loathes the overregarding of dreams. So there's that sort of signpost there for any future editor to think, oh, well, you know, Baxter's got a few doubts about this. I wonder whether or not we should proceed. And then by the time we get to Calamy, Sylvester making the editorial decisions, dreams, you know, smack of enthusiasm, fanatics, this kind of hotline to God that is the divine inspiration claimed by, say, Quakers and other religious sects that are too radical and too enthusiastic for Baxter or anybody editing a posthumous Baxter to want him to be associated with. John Toland is involved in a number of editorial projects in the 1690s. Um, these are very much done with a contemporary political agenda. One of the texts that he deals with is Edmund Ludlow's uh, memoirs. Uh, Ludlow was a parliamentary commander uh, in the 1640s and 50s, uh, involved in the conquest of Ireland. Um, he was also a devout Puritan, so he sees the hand of God and of providence uh, in events all over the place. The original manuscript is drenched with apocalyptic references. It has lots of biblical language, the language of Canaan. Uh, it, it, it's written in this kind of saintly prose. Uh, what Toland does in the 1690s is completely rework the text. I mean, he turns um, uh, Ludlow from a 17th century Puritan into a late 17th century Whig. Um, he removes a lot of the biblical and apocalyptic and providential elements and, and puts them into almost Roman dress, into classical dress like Scipio or Cato. So it becomes a very, very different text, and he he's also feels free to insert completely new bits of prose into the, into the text. So he remakes Ludlow in a way that's much more suitable for late 17th century ears and readers. Uh, that's a very sharp contrast to what Sylvester, that Sylvester doesn't do anything like that with Baxter. It's a much more kind of faithful reproduction of what, what Baxter uh, had written. I think it's fairly clear to Calamy that Sylvester's project is just too large uh, and the result is going to be too big and it's not going to be a popular work. And so he's anxious to create a much more uh, usable text uh, by removing the, the, the rather arid passages where documents are included and so on to create a new narrative. But he actually does something more than that. He takes one of the chapters by Baxter uh, and creates a much larger chapter, chapter uh, 9, uh, which is over two-fifths of the volume. He publishes at a key time in 1702, uh, just as William III dies and Queen Anne, uh, who is a great supporter of the church, uh, comes to the throne. And he says in his biography that he deliberately published it then uh, to, so that it would be available for the members of Parliament to read and to understand really where dissent was coming from. Callum is a great defender of, of, of dissent. He produces a, a number of uh, quite challenging works to defend dissenters against the charge of schism. It's fair to remember him today as the biographer of the ejected ministers. And from his uh, ninth uh, chapter, two-fifths of his volume, he produced uh, another two, um, if you like, uh, editions, wh wh where he added material which was given to him by the sons and families of the ejected ministers and other materials that he collected uh, in 1713 and in 1727. And in part, this is a riposte uh, to John Walker and his sufferings of the Church of England clergy, the sufferings that they had endured during the 1640s and 50s. And I think one would have to say that Calamy's um, achievements were much more successful than Walker's. I, I, think, the, I think the problem with Calamy is that, that his archive should have survived and it hasn't. And we, and it's one of those very sad um, stories because we know it existed within the family until 1870. And indeed, a, a very celebrated 19th century, early 20th century historian did an awful lot of work on um, dissent in the uh, period between 1660 and um, really the mid-18th century. Alexander Gordon saw it. Uh, and after the death of the final, the, the last surviving male member, Matthew Calamy, it just got dispersed. And the odd item survives as an item in the, in the body, which I'm pretty certain was part of this collection.